Welcome to The Foundry, where leaders are forged daily. Each week we investigate themes of leadership, entrepreneurship, and mindset with some of the greatest minds in real estate. And now, the data scientist of real estate, George Roberts. Welcome back, entrepreneurs. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Greg Bronson, who has nearly 20 years of industry experience, primarily focused on residential property sectors, including student housing, multifamily, and senior housing. Uh, he has acquisitions at Ashland Capital. He's closed over $2 billion of transactions throughout his career across acquisitions, refinancing, and recapitalizations, leveraging his debt and equity relationships. He's an adjunct professor at the NYU Shack Institute of Real Estate. So I know that uh, investors are going to want to stay to the end today because uh, we're going to talk about a lot of great sectors of real estate and a lot of different approaches to private equity. So definitely, this is an interview that I've been looking forward to. And with that, I'd like to welcome you to the show, Greg. Welcome. Thanks very much, George. Great to be here. All right. Well, I know Ashland is, is doing a lot of uh, really great things in, in multiple sectors, as I mentioned. One of the things you've been doing, you do multifamily, but I, I find it interesting to kind of get away from the multifamily. I know so many of our listeners are doing that. I think a lot of them are probably looking for other sectors that they can diversify into. And I think student housing, student housing is something that's very interesting to me. So tell me what's brought you into student housing and uh, what do you see as the outlook for student housing? Yeah, so student housing has been a really strong property sector for the last handful of years and has you know, very significant tailwinds behind it. You know, the, the properties are a little bit more recession resilient or recession resistant than multifamily properties because students, people go to school when the economy is bad. Um, and so, you know, the outlook for stronger post-secondary ac academia is, is great in the U.S. Now, there's a lot of universities that are out there. Um, we focus on the kind of tier one, those over 20,000 enrollment with rising enrollment trends. Um, but, you know, those, those are underhoused from an on-campus housing standpoint, the, the student housing that we focus on is private off-campus student housing. So it's not affiliated with the university. It is, um, it is a really unique property type. We lease by the bed instead of by the unit. And so there's a little bit of rental revenue arbitrage basically that we get by renting those bedrooms to students because they don't want to pay for a whole unit. They don't want to be on the hook for a roommate if that roommate moves out or you know, transfers to another school or something like that. So their risk is more limited because they're just paying for their specific space. Obviously, the, the credit of a lot of students is lower we get parental guarantees on those leases. And we also have the term of the lease be for 12 months as opposed to during the academic year. So on-campus student housing generally does a 10-month lease or a semester-long lease, but we get all 12 months even when the students are not there during the summertime. So, you know, it's a, it's a, great business. It has a lot of operational intensity to it because of the fact that you wind up moving in all of your residents at the start of the academic year and a bunch of them move out at the end of the academic year. So you have a very significant lease rollover and, and leasing focus in the business relative to multifamily. So, you know, we have to start leasing in August, September, October, in order to be full for the upcoming August. So understanding the nuances of how a specific market operates 
is really key in order to execute on the business. So you mentioned the parental guarantees. I, I know, make an analogy to multifamily. A lot of times uh, you, you have to forfeit like, uh, you know, X months of rent if you break your lease. Uh, sometimes can be a little bit difficult to collect on. What sort of rate of success do you have uh, with the rental guarantee? So I'd say across all residential property sectors, when somebody breaks their lease, you know, and, and violates the terms of the lease, breaks their lease and doesn't pay the remaining term of the lease, provided your lease says that that is their obligation, it is not the easiest thing in the world to collect on because we have not just the students signing the lease, but also their parents um, in many cases. Sometimes a student can self-qualify, but we, I would say we, we have good success in certain markets. In other markets, it can be, it can be challenging, but the parental guarantee does ensure a greater degree of compliance with the lease as it's laid out, you know, more likelihood to pay. And, you know, that, that makes the property sector, again, you know, very attractive because we have two parties guaranteeing that lease, not just one. And just for a point of reference, uh, how, how would you say your uh, collections are compared to multifamily? I know it's kind of apples and oranges. You have different classes, et cetera. I mean, if you have A class multifamily versus C, it uh, can be a different, uh, but uh, just for a point of reference, what, what would you say? Quite honestly, I, I don't have that statistic you know, at, at my fingertips. Um, in general, bad debt in student housing is largely in line with multifamily. So, yeah. you know, you know we, we have somewhere between zero and 2% bad debt, depending on what the property is, where the market is, where the rents are relative to market and so forth. And, and just for everyone's benefit, bad debt is basically collection loss. It's you know how much of the lease payments are not paid, not collected from the residents. Great. Now, I know you mentioned uh, at least one way that you're differentiating yourself from your competition. You're acquiring 12-month leases versus 10. Uh, what are some of the other ways you're, uh, you're differentiating? Like, for example, uh, the, the strategy of going after the tier one universities. I think for larger players, that, that tends to be something uh, very common. What, what are some of the sort of less common things you're doing to, to find your niche? So, you know, I would say that we're we're looking for some degree of value creation. So we don't need to be right on the campus periphery because you know the, the, the properties that are walking distance to campus trade at a certain premium or price at a certain premium that makes the yields lower, but things that are a little further where there's limited supply, limited pipeline of supply, and barriers to entry, you know, those markets and those opportunities in those markets, we, we certainly like. So students that want to live just a little bit off of campus. And, and pay less than the stuff that is right, right next to campus that has built in the last, been built in the last five to 10 years and, and costs a, a, a pretty penny. All right, excellent. Well, uh, you know, student housing, I mean, this is something that's kind of gone through some changes during COVID. You didn't have uh, students going in, uh, some major changes sort of back and forth there. But uh, now that things have stabilized, what would you say is, is our outlook? I mean, you mentioned some tailwinds earlier. Do you want to elaborate? Well, just going back to your COVID comment, you know, student housing from a occupancy and rent growth perspective you know, really well occupancy perspective, outpaced multifamily during COVID because a lot of students chose to be on or on or around campus to be amongst their peers as opposed to, you know, stuck in their parents' house. Um, that made it a very attractive value proposition for them. And so for those schools that weren't completely shut down, like some of the ones in 
the California uh, university system, you know, those, those occupancies stayed strong. Now, you know, that obviously came with the importance of having remote education in school being in session to some degree, but that has made, that has shown that student housing is, you know, a solid property type and can, for, can perform in up and down cycles. In terms of tailwinds, um, you know, supply is limited relative to, you know, what the supply pipeline has looked like in the past few years as a result of, of construction costs and financing markets and so forth. So, you know, the, the demand is there. Universities that have on-campus dorms are focusing on upgrading those dorms or privatizing them because being in the real estate business isn't the best business for a school that needs to be focused on academia and technology. Um, so yeah, I wonder if they're it, really even doing their their primary job at some times, but you know, <laughs> we can talk about critical thinking and, and other topics some other day. Well, you, you know, I, I teach also, as you mentioned, George, so I, I can comment. But you teach on, economics, that's different. I teach, <laughs> that's I teach real estate. I, I oh, teach real estate, real I'm estate. sorry. Yeah, I teach real estate, finance, and investments. I, I won't get into the education environment in the States because that's probably a, a, a giant conversation. But overall, you know, universities don't like being in the student housing market because it's so capital intensive and they'd rather they'd rather outsource it. So we have actually seen some transactions over the last few years where universities have looked to sell their on-campus student housing. And the way they do that is they continue to own the dirt underneath that property and enter into a ground lease with the buyer, but the, the, the buyer owns the structure above the ground and operates the property. Yeah, well, great stuff. You know, I love the model of student housing. Anytime that you can get paid per bed as opposed to per unit, uh, thinking about some similar models like um, addiction or here, here's another thing we're going to get into and, and let's get into it right now. What about uh, senior care? Yeah, so, you know, I, I've done a lot in the senior housing space over the years. Um, Ashland is focused on multifamily and student, not on senior, but, um, you know, senior is outperforming historical norms there. You know, the, the idea is that the silver tsunami, you know, the, the aging baby boomers are finally hitting the point where they're looking to enter these properties and, and, you know, sell their, sell their homes. And, and so there's, there's a lot of demand growing occupancies are the highest they've been historically and the outlook is stronger than it's ever been but the the nation is underserved from a senior housing standpoint uh, a lot of the stuff that exists is 70s and and earlier construction that that is very that is lower quality and then there's other things that have been built at the very high end over the last few years to, you know, to the top five, 10% of affordability, but the middle market is really what's missing because a, a nice quality product that is easily affordable for the masses is, is really just less available today. Yeah, truly said. Uh, we have a major housing crisis, uh, not just for seniors, but we we're producing seniors at a very, very high rate. So uh, I think that when it comes to senior housing, the uh, the tailwinds are are pretty obvious. Uh, I, I know that's something you're not currently very much focused on, but anything else that our listeners might want to know from a diversification standpoint, like say you are in multifamily, uh, GPLP. Well, what else would you want to say about the senior sector? I'd say that, you know, really the affordability and the availability of, of seniors housing just, again, is really the biggest issue. Um, 
away from Ashland, I do some senior housing work um, and it is focused on the middle market. So, you know, we're seeing strong demand in that space and, you know, believe that, as you noted, the tailwinds are really there, you know, for continued growth and demand in that, in that sector. All right. Outstanding, Greg. I want to thank you so much for coming and talking to our audience about uh, multifamily, student housing, senior housing. Listeners, make sure you stay tuned because in our second segment of this interview, we had the opportunity to talk about Greg's uh, private credit fund at Ashland Capital. There's a lot of things uh, that he can do for you as investors, Uh, whether you're on the side of wanting to borrow the money or whether you're on the side of just simply wanting to enjoy those great passive returns. I think you'll appreciate his perspective and just want to make sure that people know where best to reach out to you, Greg. So uh, I feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm easy to find. And my email is greg, G-R-E-G, at ashlandcapitalfund.com. 